wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. If I could pull out your heart right now, if I could take every thought you have ever had from your first waking moment until this very hour, if I could take every thought you've ever had, not just your deeds, but your thoughts, only your thoughts, and I could put them on a video, and I could show that video here in this auditorium tonight, you would run off of this campus and you would never show your face here again because you have thought things so wicked and so perverted you cannot even share them with your closest friend. As a matter of fact, if your closest friends knew some of the thoughts you've had against him, he would no longer be your friend. And young man, I do not know that because I'm a prophet. I know that because it's what the scriptures say, and I know that like you, I too am a man. You would spend every ounce of energy to hide from everyone in this room what has gone through your mind just in the last hour. Don't tell me scripture's not right when it talks about all men having sinned because all men are sinners. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. This can mean evil from childhood, evil from a babe. Imagine for a moment an 18-month-old baby that you're holding in your arms. And that 18-month-old baby sees that shiny watch on your wrist. And he grabs for your watch. And you pull his hand away and say no. He begins to cry and move about in your arms. He reaches for the watch again. You grab his hand and say no. He begins to scream and cry. He reaches for the watch again. You say no. He begins to frail his arms even in the direction of your face. I submit to you that if that 18-month-old baby had the strength of an 18-year-old man, he would slaughter you there where you stand, Father. Rip the watch off your arm and walk across your bloody body out the door without feeling an ounce of remorse. You see, here's something you need to understand. Hitler was not an anomaly. Hitler was not a phenomenon. Hitler was what everyone in this room has the potential of being. And not only that, you need to understand, even in all the, all the wickedness of Hitler, Hitler was still restrained by the common grace of God. And you need to know this, that if it were not for the common grace of God restraining you in your unconverted state, you would make Hitler look like a choir boy. What we do not understand is what Scripture teaches about men. Men are evil. You say, well, I don't agree. That's because you've grabbed enough of Christianity to stand, but you don't believe the Bible. The Scripture's testimony against you and all men is that we are born with evil. And we are evil. Do you have to teach a child to lie? Do you have to teach a child to be self-centered? Do you have to teach a child to be selfish? Do you have to teach a child to be brutal to other children? They learn that on their own. Set them free. Discipline them not and see what you have in ten years. A monster. Why? Because what Scripture says is true. And you hold your ears and you say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. In the same way that a person dying of cancer is in denial and says to the doctor, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But by cupping the hands over your ears, you close yourself off from any remedy. The Bible calls all men haters of God and enemies of God. You say, but I love God ever since I was little. No, you loved an image of God that you created with your own mind and you loved what you made. But if someone would have come to you and pointed out the God of Scripture, you would have said, I could never love a God like that. So many times I'll go to people and they say, well, I've loved God all my life. And I say, can I sit down with you for a half an hour and just explain from Scripture some of the historical Christian beliefs about God? And after a half an hour, a good churchman will say, that's not my God. And I have to say, of course it's not. But it is the God of Scripture. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Because we ourselves, prior to conversion, have a heart of stone, a God-hating heart, a heart of evil, born in sin, given towards sin. That is the testimony of Scripture. Some of you, in your 60s, 70s, you heard preaching like this all the time when you were children. 
But now it seems the new generations to follow cannot bear with truth. They would rather be deceived and think well of themselves. But a man who will not accept his illness cannot be healed. A man who does not have all his hopes crushed with regard to his own self-righteousness, merit, and worth cannot turn to Christ. We must realize that we are destitute and there is only one Savior and His name is Jesus. So the first thing that we must come to grips with is the gospel does not begin with man. It begins with God, who He is. The, the whole thing of the gospel, judgment, heaven and hell all comes back to the righteous character of God. And what people do not understand, it's often not, uh, very rarely is ever put forth in, in the gospel today, is this. Everything revolves around this one thing. If God is just, he cannot forgive me. It, it's the same as if someone slaughtered your entire family and you caught them and took them to the police and the police handed them over to a judge and the judge said, I'm a very loving judge, so I'm going to let this man go free. You would cry out for justice. You would write to Congress. You would uh, call your senator. You would be on the 6 o'clock news saying that there's a judge more vile on the bench than the men he sets free. A judge must do righteously. God is the judge of all the earth, and he will do right. The problem is man has sinned. Man must die. Man is under the wrath of God. Jesus, our loving Savior, taught that in John chapter 3. The only way for a just God to be able to forgive wicked men is for Him to first satisfy His own justice and appease His wrath. And He has done that through the death of His Son. So many people today have this idea that somehow the Romans and the Jews rejecting and beating up Jesus resulted in payment for our sin. And they do not realize that our sins were paid for on that tree because when Christ was on that tree, he bore the guilt of his people. He stood in their law place. He became a curse in their place. And then the Father crushed him under the full force of his own wrath. Go back to the story of uh, Abraham and his son. As Abraham gave himself over to the will of God and came down with that knife to slaughter his son, God stopped his hand. People think that that's the end of the story. It's not. It's the intermission. Later, many years later, God took that knife, laid his hand upon the brow of his only begotten son, and slaughtered him on that tree. Someone had to die under the wrath of Almighty God to satisfy justice. And Christ did that, and his resurrection proves it. And now he's ascended up into heaven. He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And God does not ask anyone to open up their heart and ask Jesus. That is not the apostolic instruction. God commands all men everywhere to repent of their sins and believe the gospel. The evidence... No one has ever been able to bear the preaching of the gospel. They will either turn against it with the fierceness of an animal or they will be converted. Throw yourself upon Christ. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. We are not called to build empires. We are not called to be accepted. We are called to glorify God. Eternity. The day you stand in those granite halls before the Lord of glory and kings, the greatest men on earth are divided and split and called. Some cast into eternal hell and some invited into eternal glory live for eternity. These Olympians, how, how majestic they are, but only for a moment. They start training when they're four and five years old. They never do anything but train until they're 22. They run a nine-second race for a medal they hang up, and that's it. Cannot you give equal for eternal things. There is one there who is infinite in glory and you will spend an eternity of eternities tracking him down and you will never get your arms even around the foothill of his mountain. I can't live like this anymore. I can't live just reading books. I can't live just reading about revivals and about people who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew you. 
so many different things you want to know and do and all the books get out a book on God this one for it is for this we labor and strive because we fixed our hope on the living God this is not some martyr thing in which we uselessly give our lives to nothing only to be pulverized without hope no we serve God and God will honor us we have fixed our hope on that and that gives us strength strength oh this life is a vapor I'm 47 but yesterday I was 21 where did it all go it is a vapor while you have strength preach I praise God that in his providence as a young man I spent myself in the Andes mountains and in the jungles of Peru doing what I no longer have the strength to do while you are a young man while there is strength in you labor with all your might take those stupid video games of yours and crush them under your feet throw the TV out the window you were made for greater things than these if you're a child of the king nothing on this earth can satisfy nothing I want the power of God on my life then something's gotta go I want to know Him, then some separation has to occur. Anything it takes, you have to literally be before the Lord. Lord, anything it takes, anything it takes.